he was like, oh, they didn't think we had, they had two million. Well, guess what? They had a million. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely something that we're going to be talking about a Has lot. Has anybody else been arrested uh, in connection with this case? Since, since not that we know of. Not okay. that we know of, yeah. And so that's another thing, too, is that, that uh, Attorney Phillips brought up, was he was saying that we haven't seen any other arrests and that there are probably deals, uh, plea deals, I'm assuming, mm-hmm. uh, being made with the informants and uh, whoever. Right, so. Uh, it's 840. Uh, let's go into the KUM News Zoom room. We're about to get pretty interesting here. So we have Senator Tello Tidegui, Senator Joanne Brown, uh, Republicans, and we're going to be talking about, uh, among other things, I'm sure, this uh, Bill 108, right? So you guys have got into a pretty heated debate with uh, Bill's main sponsor, um, Senator Mary Torres, and it was kind of relative to rules and regulations for adoption agency setting up shop on Guam because I didn't know like all an adoption agency needs to do to, to operate on Guam is get a business license which th- I was like whoa that's kind of crazy um, that that's all they got to do to set up shop um, but you guys had raised issues about a lack of rules and regulations to kind of adequately police and monitor these adoption agencies um, in Senator Torres's bill and then public health uh, Deputy Terry Uggen had submitted what a couple pages of uh, testimony, and he kind of went down uh, Senator Torres's bill and raised a bunch of issues about basically what I took away from him. And tell me if you guys disagree. He was basically like, "Wow, we're just giving too much authority in, uh, to these adoption agencies, and there's you know conflict of interest uh, potential." So he had there was like, I think about five, six, seven different concerns he had with this bill and then that led to a set aside of the bill um but last night the governor uh sent a letter to all the senators and she basically uh explained away public health testimony and said oh no that at no time was that to be considered opposition uh to this bill and then it was just weird because we saw terry uggan sign this thing and he's like a longtime public health I mean, he's a career public health employee who's been in the institution, who knows what he's talking about. And then you had the governor kind of like stepping all over his toes, coming out with this letter that basically was, we really love your bill, Senator Torres, and all the issues that public health brought up. Uh, We're just going to explain away. And I just thought that was such an interesting development. And I got to say, I called it yesterday. I called it when I talked about Terry Uggins' testimony. I said, just watch. Adeloup's going to bully him to either recant it or they're going to come out with something that um, addresses these concerns that public health had. And that's exactly what happened. So here we are. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, uh, Kirsten, I th- thank you for the, um, the play-by-play. It's, it's, it's getting on, on key, on note. Uh, we've been in there for almost two days discussing uh, this bill and um you know kudos to terry you know for he, he's also you know he's also a foster parent as well not only has he been over at uh, public health but he's also a foster parent and he knows firsthand yeah. um about the needs of children uh, who, who are have a total disadvantage you know, and so my hat's off to him for coming out and saying what he had to say, because, you know, in good conscience, as I said on the floor to all my colleagues, you know, I hope you, when you go to sleep at night and you close your eyes, you can do it within, with good conscience. You know, you're able to even sleep. But the, um, the bill, don't get me wrong, we, we all agree that, you know, if there's, and I don't disagree with having an adoption agency on Guam. We don't have one. This will be the very first one. And it's ironic that there are no rules and regulations. Um, and, and I brought up an analogy with a, a friend of mine yesterday. And I said, you know, people who cut hair have more accountability, regulations, and standards and rules than a person opening an adoption agency holding children. You have someone going to cosmetology school, have to go to cosmetology, goes to Revin Tax, gets a business license, and then have to go to public health to get a, a permit, a license to work. And that's just to cut hair. Now we're looking at our, our children on Guam, babies, newborn babies, our children. And it's ironic because 
you know, we are having a, a problem with foster children. And that's the focus that we should go into, helping these children who are in foster care. There wasn't, and according to Terry's letter, a, a real need on adoption. He gave us the numbers of the 432 children in foster care, zero infants were available for adoption. And, and we know that infants are the higher priority of adoption agencies because they're, you know, that's what most people who want to adopt children want are babies. You know, and that it's, it's, it's pretty scary that Guam is going to allow a company to come in here without any guidelines, rules or regulations, accountability, transparency to, to set up shop here. We're just opening the floodgates for any, anybody else to come to this island and open up an adoption agency who, who does not have good intentions. And we saw the same thing happen in the Marshall Islands when there are human trafficking, enticing women to give up their babies for $10,000 and then selling them to, to parents in the States for $40,000. You know, it, it just, and if this company who's here, Ohala, if they, you know, um, really want to be upstanding citizens and, and, you know, holding to an accountability that we're looking for, then they shouldn't have an issue with having to, um, you know, go through rules and regulations and uh, requirements needed. So it just, it's very upsetting. We, we proffered some um, amendments on the floor and it was ironic because these amendments that I proffered on the floor, uh, Next day, two days later, we get a, a letter from Terry and, and it was all these amendments that I put on the floor and they, they failed. Only four of us, four of us voted for these uh, amendments. And you know, that I, I have a couple more that I wanna to proffer too. So it, it's just so disheartening. I mean, we need some accountability, especially when it comes to our children, so. Um, I just don't uh, understand why um, my colleagues are not uh, um, caring so much about our children. Uh, you know, it's confusing because in Terry's letter uh, to Senator Torres, um, he raises an issue that he's not aware of existing rules and regulations for adoption agencies to be licensed on Guam. And this is kind of, to me, the center of the whole argument is you have Senator Torres saying, Oh, it's public health. Of course they're in charge of adoption on Guam. But then you have Terry Uggen from public health saying there are no rules and regs existing in place. But then the governor, in throwing Terry's testimony under the bus, says, yeah, I mean, she basically is mirroring exactly what Senator Torres is saying. What do you make of that, Senator Joanne? Well, I mean, certainly I don't want to see poor Terry again, uh, you know, who, as you mentioned, is a career public health employee working with Child Protective Services. I mean, many years ago, Chris, I actually worked on a task force with Terry again back in our early days, and this is decades ago, uh, to address the requirements and regulations for daycare centers on Guam for our children, you know, to make sure that there was a proper ratio of um, daycare employee to the children the environment these children were kept in and how they were taken care of, what the safety measures that needed to be put in place within our daycare uh, daycare companies here on Guam. And we actually went to every single daycare at the time, um, you know, to address these issues and, and also formalize uh, to ensure that these children, when, when parents bring their children to a daycare center, that they're meeting standards and requirements for their own safety and well-being, and also ensuring that uh, the daycare providers were responsible individuals in our community because you're putting you're putting in their care, you know, the most important and, and precious thing that we have. So I'm not unfamiliar with Terry. I've known him for many years. I certainly don't want to put him in the middle of this. I mean, a lot of the concerns that he relayed in his letter, uh, he actually relayed during the virtual public hearing a couple months ago. So this is not something that just, you know, came up a couple days ago uh, just because his letter was provided. Uh, and, uh, you know, it puts him in an awkward position because now, you know, the, uh, he is a deputy now at, at Department of Public Health. And, and then, you know, we have the letter coming out uh, yesterday, late yesterday by the governor, governor's office, uh, 
you know, essentially not really uh, recognizing any of those key concerns that he is a, a public health professional who's worked many years with our children and our community. Uh, you know, that personally puts him in an awkward stand, but but certainly the issues that he's raised, uh, you know, we, we, we recognize it, we take it to heart because of who he is and his background and his credentials that he brings to the table. Uh, but, you know, with this administration, I mean, I, I expected nothing less. I mean, with regards to trying to water down uh, this whole issue of putting protective measures in this legislation to protect children. I think we've been very clear in hearing where this administration stands with regards to protecting the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, but for us, uh, we have no argument. We, we've said it repeatedly. We have no argument if this, if this legislation would include what we see are very important protective measures of simply providing the structure and the requirements for, for, for you know, the current uh, adoption agency that's come forth that, that is interested in providing the service. Uh, we want that to be consistent. So any other uh, adoption agency that may want to set up shop on Guam, that they have standards, rules and regulations, performance standards that can be evaluated. Uh, simply having a concurrent letter between uh, the current DYA director, uh, Melanie Brennan, that has been through executive order provided uh, oversight over CPS uh, and their agreement that, oh, we're just simply going to regulate, regulate according to what? I mean, the main sponsor would cite sections of the law, but those sections of law really simply have to do with the procedures of adoption and does not address because we've not had an adoption agency established on Guam. So it doesn't specifically address that. And we are a bit concerned as to why something that should be expected, you know, putting these protection measures in place. I mean, the fact that it has had so much resistance is very concerning because we simply want to make sure those standards are there. It's clear to everyone. It's in the law. Uh, and these, uh, these adoption agencies will be properly evaluated. I mean, the argument is too much bureaucracy. There's not enough staff. Well, you know, this current uh, bill as proposed doesn't put any additional funds or resources uh, towards public health with regards to this. So it, it's just unfortunate, but you know, we're gonna continue to push on this issue. We certainly want people to be aware of what is going on and certainly our public. I, I mean, they, they know what's going on. They can come to their own determinations. But the fact there's such resistance to simply putting in these requirements to ensure consistency, as, as Senator Tello mentioned, accountability, transparency in how this process occurs. I mean, we're hoping none of those negative things that have happened in other jurisdictions, including most recently the Marshall Islands, doesn't happen on Guam. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves. We see issues of, of how our children are harmed and abused in this community on a fairly regular basis. And that's something that's very concerning. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that these things are happening. And we simply wanna ensure that these children that may not be uh, born into a fortunate circumstance because of uh, you know, the challenges of the birth parent, whatever those cases may be, uh, certainly we want them to go into loving, caring homes that are gonna support them. I, we, we want to see that for our community. We wanna see that for all our children on this island. And simply putting these, what, what aren't even really uh, an additional requirement, we look at this as a standard. I mean, many other jurisdictions that have adoption agencies have more requirements than simply getting a, reg, uh, you know, a, a, a license, a business license of rather tax and setting up shop. And so, you know, we, we don't see this as an extraordinary requirement. We see this as what should be the standard requirement. Uh, yeah, Senator Brown, but I have to ask you guys about this uh, press release that came out from the Republican Party of Guam. I know you guys uh, saw it, but it basically says the Republican Party of Guam supports this measure in its entirety. Well, you know, the Republican Party of Guam... Is that, wait, first, is that, a, is that a real simply, is that a real Republican Party of Guam release, though? Or is it a fake I, one? Because I, I, I don't I, know. You know I, I just want to be sure. Unless they come out and say otherwise, right? Uh, we know there have been issues in the not-too-distant past about uh, Republican <laughs> releases from the party. Did that look like a real one to you, Bree? Was the, did it have a watermark? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it has our logo, right? It yeah. has our logo. You know, yeah. Chris, with regards, with regards to this issue, I mean, certainly the Republican Party of Guam and those of us that, that run and exist under the banner uh, have made you know, our position very clear about being pro-life. And that's, that's an important part of the Republican agenda for Guam. And, and we're in support of that. I don't think we argue that at all. 
Um, unfortunately, I think the, the press release came out at a time when this issue was being debated on the floor, and I know there was a lot of back and forth on this issue. But, you know, one of our party members kind of brought up a very good point in saying, you know, we should leave the policy debates to the policymakers and the party uh, certainly should be focusing on how they can facilitate uh, the Republican agenda of getting more support, more candidates, uh, and pursuing the main principles of our party and our community. Uh, they interjected themselves, unfortunately, at a time when we were debating these issues, and we certainly should. I think it's very important to have healthy debate. But, you know, if we all agreed on every little thing, you've got to wonder what Kool-Aid we're drinking. I mean, we right. should be able to Some do of that these Kool-Aid. issues. We should be able to do so. Uh, and there, that's the concern. I'm sure the party is not going to agree to not wanting to have, you know, these standards in place with regards to a, how an adoption agency is supposed to run and operate on Guam and how an adoption agency is supposed to be audited and evaluated. So while I understand and certainly recognize it's in line with regards to the, you know, the party agenda, uh, that that was kind of like an area perhaps they should have gotten. I shouldn't say get more into. They probably should have stepped out of simply because. Uh, we should have the right to debate these issues openly and honestly on the floor of the legislature and be able to bring up our concerns without you know, our party or any other party trying to interject with regards to that debate. I mean, we ultimately, once we are elected, and certainly we still maintain our Republican Party principles, uh, but when the floor of the legislature, you know, we are there representing the interests of the people. And certainly for myself, I know for Senator Tello and a number of our colleagues, I mean, that's our, that's our primary priority uh, once we're elected to office. Um, so in April, the public hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, so what was the testimony from uh, DYA slash CPS? Well, you know, because if you've seen the public hearing, I think it was on, uh, I'm not mistaken, April, you can go on, on um, YouTube and review the uh, public hearing, which was on April 20th at, at 9 a.m. And you'll see that, you know, DYA came and testified not in favor of it completely. Yeah. yeah. Very uh, again came up and, and also testified not in favor of the bill, uh, um, as well as Tess Archangel, who is another employee of part, uh, public health who's been there for for decades. But most especially a person that we all respect in the community who's done so much for our children on Guam who are disadvantaged is Bethany Taylor. We all recognize that as a foster child, and even her testimony. She was very confused about this bill. Um, she saw that there was issues with it. And the last part of her testimony was stating that there should be a round table um, regarding this bill. That we should get together and discuss this. And like I said, we're not against having an adoption agency on Guam. We just need one that has good intentions and follow rules and regulations like other adoption companies or agencies in the state, in the state. Um, and other territories for that matter. But this legislation here basically gives an advantage to this adoption agency that doesn't even have any guidelines or rules and regulations to follow in order to be in an adoption agency in the first place. And you know, the author of the bill keeps touting that, oh, there are rules and regulations that Senator Brown has mentioned um, in in our, in our Guam law, but those laws were created for public health to follow. Those laws were created for individuals who wanted to adopt a child. And it was not created, or there were no guidelines in there, created for private companies coming in and opening a private adoption agency, not company, but a private adoption agency coming in and opening up shop at all. And what this legislation does it gives them carte blanche authority to actually take the child. <clears throat> and in some cases here, there's a major conflict of interest because there's a group called the ASC. And the ASC is a group of individuals that are made up of an adoption supervisor, natural parents caseworker, adoption caseworker, a third uh, social worker staff. These are members of the um, Adoption Selection Committee. And to incorporate into this committee a representative from an independent adoption agency is a major total conflict of interest. They are individuals that um, would place children with parents um, that come to their company, come to their agency, 
and that gives them an advantage. Well, what happens if another, <clears throat> excuse me, adoption agency comes to Guam and they're not allowed to sit on this, uh, um, this panel? I mean, it was clear that we saw it plain as day that it's a total conflict of interest. You know, I made an effort to call an adoption agency out of Hawaii. I always try and take jurisdictions that are very similar to Guam and spoke to her about, you know, what are the rules and guidelines. And I actually sent her a copy of the bill to give her perspective. And she, that was the first thing she pointed out as well. And that's also what, what uh, Terry pointed out in his, his letter. So this legislation is such an advantage to this adoption agency that it, it, there's no account, real accountability. For instance, safe haven when a child is first born, it, it was included into this and the infant relinquishes under the new safe haven act pursuant to article chapter 13, title nine, and it will require, um, will not require an ACS meeting. Now, when a child is about to be placed into a home, the, the group gets together to discuss, you know, what is in the best interest, interest of the child. Well, in this legislation, they say that the ASC doesn't have to meet at all to discuss where this new child goes into, uh, where this child goes to. Now they, you know, the author says, well, these guidelines are pre-approved uh, applications. And if you think about pre-approved applications, well, you're incorporating an adoption agency to sit on that pre-approved committee to decide where that child goes. Of course, they're, they're gonna have an advantage to this. So there, there's so many uh, red flags on this and all we're trying to do is, okay, let's just have these guidelines and rules and regulations for people opening up adoption agencies to follow. You know, I went on and their website. Uh, so we're talking about the a company that has set up shop on Guam. They even have an Instagram, by the way, uh, Ohala Adoptions. And if you go on their website, which is ohalaadoptions.org, there's a pop-up screen, and it says, we're thrilled to hear that DPHSS is concerned about adoption service regulation. Proper regulations protect all adoption parties, and most importantly, the children. Now is a perfect time for everyone to review these laws, ensuring adoption is safe, legal, and that all entities are held accountable to one standard. Our services adhere to all current Guam adoption standards, and we will continue to maintain compliance with any regulations put in place. Which they should, but they're not uh, telling the author of this legislation to incorporate rules and regulations. She's the one that's been objecting to incorporate rules and regulations for adoption co agencies coming to Guam, well, people wanting to open. Now, don't get me wrong, there are rules and regulations that public health follows, as well as any attorney that gets involved when it comes to uh, uh, adoption. I mean, how do we do it currently without the adoption agency being on Guam? We've been doing that for years without this agency. And there are guidelines to show how to go about adopting. And CPS, public health, is there every step of the way to ensure the best interest of the child. This legislation puts this adoption agency at the front line. You know, it, it doesn't provide any kind of um, accountability in the first place for this adoption agency in order to get to the front of, lot of the line. And that's all we're trying to do is to provide that. <clears throat> Sounds pretty simple, but let me ask you this. So we had a public hearing in April. You had CPS DYA say, yeah, we're not, we oppose this. Public health said, oh, there's all kinds of issues. Um, you guys bring up these points on the floor, but then the governor swoops in with a letter that just trumps, I guess it's supposed to just trump everything that was ever said on the record about this measure from the various uh, department heads. And now here we are where the governor says, I don't care what these career professionals are saying about Mary Torres' bill, we love it a thousand percent. Well, that's something obviously for the public to, to look at and come to their own determination. I mean, it, you, you would think that this should be a non-issue to begin with. You would think that in wanting to move forward this, this, this bill and make it a, a good bill, 
um, you know, you can't do this halfway with something this serious and this important. I mean, like I asked my colleagues, I mean, would you take your most valuable, you know, possession that you have in this world, in the physical world, and just hand it over to anybody, you know, be it your favorite diamond ring, your, your, your pickup truck, your, your cell phone. Uh, and know that there's no requirements, formal requirements uh, that the person you're giving it to has to meet in order to to have possession of those things that you, you think are so important. Uh, you know, we're talking about our children in this community. We want to continue to make sure they're safe. I'm sure a lot of people at the table that have come forth, they have the very same concerns, especially those that actually work in this field, you know, people like Terry Uggen who've made a career. And I, I really feel for Terry because he's been put in a very unusual position. I mean, yeah. he's, he's a career a public health employee working with CPS and he is the current deputy at Department of Public Health. And certainly uh, the governor of Guam is, is, you know, his boss. So I'm sure this puts him in an awkward position, but I do appreciate all Terry did was simply formalize in writing what he had relayed a couple of months ago. And as I mentioned on the floor, had we had that roundtable discussion to further review this issue, I think we could have produced an even better bill uh, that would have been reflective of addressing these concerns rather than having this bill rush to the floor and then having to, to bring this up and having to make this argumentative, which is something we could otherwise be getting up as we do with a number of bills and supporting it and moving it, you know, moving it forward in the process. I mean, this was unnecessary. Uh, and this, this bill is not perfect. I mean, this, this bill has this key issue in our view that needs to be addressed if this, if this uh, amendment that Senator Tello has put forth and sponsored is included in the bill, I would be happy. I would be happy to vote for it. I wouldn't have to be raising an objection, uh, but because to us and looking at this, this outstanding concern still exists, uh, it's very hard to, to simply celebrate and say, yo, this is a wonderful bill, by all means, let's vote for it. Uh, we can't just look at the personalities that are at the table right now, Chris, because that's always changing. When we put laws in place, we can't have the laws just be about ourselves and our personality and who's who and what's what. We have to ensure that what we're putting in law is something that's going to stand the test of time. And that no matter who, you know, and eventually everything changes, you know, none of us are permanent, including people that are representing the current adoption agency on Guam. So we simply want to make sure these are the standards, these are the requirements that public health has to go in and, and determine that they're meeting these requirements. This is our public standard here. Uh, and if that's in place, then I think we have a level of comfort that we would be more than happy to support this bill. But I think to simply object and not incorporate, you got to wonder, I mean, it's not like we're trying to add something so, you know, out of yeah. you know outer space. No, I think that's interesting. We're adding something that should be really the most important thing actually it's a new uh, that it's, we include it's a new industry to make right? sure that our children mm -hmm. are protected right it's a new industry and you're right i don't understand what the blowback is about um either it's ohala hawaiian o-h-a-l-a -A -A, but i mean they had a they have a business license on guam they have a website that apparently is updated pretty frequently because they got a big pop-up there about uh public health they've got an instagram they have a business license. So are they currently doing adoptions and are we concerned at all that? But, but there's nothing regulating them. There's nothing, no standards or anything regulating them. Um, if you ask me, it's almost similar as the, the attorneys, you know, that are adopt, uh, going through adoption, but you know, um, the, the, it's, it's the funding part. I mean, it's scary because of what happened in the Marshall Islands, you know, from paying a, a mother 10,000 and then turning around and, and charging the, the adoptive parents $40,000. That's very concerning. You know, I'm sorry to go back to this, but I just want to give your listening audience some of the, uh, one of the first concerns, second concerns that the governor had wrote in her letter to uh, Senator Torres. And it's ironic that she, she addresses it to Senator Torres instead of the legislature, because she's saying that- uh, That's her girl girl name, it's her gangs. Right. It, it, it's it's ironic, shouldn't it say, dear senators, you know, half a day senators, you know, uh, public health and Lieutenant Governor Tenori and I fully support this bill. Why is she just addressing it to Senator Torres? But the when when Terry wrote down all the concerns that he brought in, um, the governor tried to counteract, like you said, Chris, and one of them that is really disheartening, and um, I plan on making an amendment on the floor, so get ready, you know, whoever's listening. Uh, she says here that on the second concern regarding the timeline for monitoring of placement for up 
to one year as discussed in GCA already allows for residency requirement to be waived by the court if it is satisfied with the best interest of the child. So the, the comment that Terry had brought in and his concern was, was the issue of up to one year. Currently, the law says that an individual, uh, a, a child shall be monitored in the placement of the adopted home for at least one year. Terry provides a comment stating that in my experience working in BASA, adoption and custody unit, Holt International requires four years monitoring period for the placement of a child in a prospective adoptive home. Guam only requires a period of one year in comparison. I recommend we maintain the current position of one year monitoring period. So according to the governor's letter or whoever wrote this letter, um, if you look at GCA, it does says that a residency, a residency of one, at least 12 months, but can be waived by the court. But in this law that's proposed on the floor, it goes to the Guam administrative rules and regulations, which is separate from the uh, Guam code annotated. These are rules and regulations that are set forth. And in the rules and regulations, it clearly says that they put a period of up to one year under the guidance and supervision of social service or the guidance of an adoption agency duly licensed under Guam. So you have the rules and regulations saying one thing, and then you have the Guam code annotated saying one thing. So which one does public health follow? It's not clear, it's not clear at all. So that's what we're trying to, to correct some of these uh, issues in this bill that clearly does not, you know, change the laws in the Guam Code Annotated. And Senator Paris actually brought something up, brought something up about that. If you're changing this, wouldn't you change the Guam Code Annotated? So this, this is wrong from the governor. What, what this letter that she writes, is contradictive to do two different sets of uh, rules and regulations in the Guam Code annotated. So it doesn't make any sense. But yeah. mo more importantly, you hear from Terry saying the, the actual the time frame for children to be monitored in their new uh, prospective adoptive home is four years. Four years. But Guam is only having one. And now you're you're saying a period of up to one year, that can mean one day. Okay, we're done. This family's good to go. No need to monitor the child anymore. Yeah, but because uh, we're kind of running out of time, um, but I did want to ask, so is the bill still set aside or, or what are we going to see? Are we going to see Senator Mary Torres hold up the governor's letter and be like, oh, concerns addressed, voting file. Right. But I think it's our colleagues that need to really uh, see the difference between a person who's been at public health for decades and who's actually a foster parent himself. Right. Who deals with this all the time. Look at his letter and then compare it to the letter sent by the governor. And it's their conscience. They're going to have to make a decision when it's time to vote and what's in the best interest. I think a couple of our other colleagues other than Senator Paris uh, Speaker Therese Chalai, Joanne, and myself that actually moved in the direction of, yeah, you know, we do need rules and regulations for the And that was Frank Bloss, who actually supported the amendment to create rules and regs. <clears throat> now, we set the bill aside, um, and we're addressing the uh, new hospital. Uh, we're in the Committee oh, of the yeah, Whole. Yeah, we're yeah. going to come back. We're going to come back, and we left off on the bill the amendment that I proffered to provide rules and regulations for people who are opening up adoption agencies. That's what we're, where we left off okay. on the floor and we're debating that on the floor. So hopefully my colleagues will, you know, hear from the public because it's obviously, you know, it's obvious they're not listening to reason or, or reports or experts in the field. They're not listening to them. So hopefully the public if you're listening, please write to your senators 
and let them know it's as simple as this. Incorporate rules and regulations for people who are coming from off island, who are not even from Guam, opening up adoption agencies on this island. Let's bring safety to our children first. Welcome back, Sabrina. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. You want to go back to the airport and leave again or what? <laughs> no. Oh, man. I don't even know what to say, guys. It's, I don't even know what to say. I want to bang my head into the wall. I really do because you're right. I mean, Terry Uggen, this is a guy who knows what he's talking about when it comes to adoption. Um, and I just can't believe that once again, I mean, we saw this with this uh, political uh, privatization of the tax collection. You had the deputy of revenue tax come out in opposition to the bill. And then they twisted her arm and put her somewhere else and, you know, made someone come out and say, no, we love it. We're seeing the same thing happen right. with this. So, <laughs> yeah, it's well, just. Chris, this is, what, this is what you call politics rearing its ugly head. Yes. Yeah. This is one of those issues again. I got to give it up to you, too, though, because you keep getting beat up. You and the speaker and Sabina, and they're just, like, slamming on you guys all the time. You got vice speaker <laughs> slamming on you. You got the governor slamming on you. It's deadly down in the legislature. You got to watch your back, even within your own party. Holy Mac. Feel for you guys. Well, you know, we just, we just got to continue. I mean, you know, we didn't, we didn't run to be, you know. And then we're getting, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's a reason, there's a reason that we're here and there's a reason that we can stand and speak about what we believe is important to us. And that's why we're here. I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to worry about that, then, you know we can handle it. I mean, there's a reason why we're here. I mean, we're speaking from, from our minds and from our hearts and from our experience on what we believe is important for this community that we live in, that we're a member of. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you see these kind of political dynamics going on, and trust me, we know it, we see it, we smell it, we, we see it. Uh, and that's all we can do. We're bringing this issue, you know, you asked to talk to us about it. We're certainly more than happy to talk to you and your listenership to bring these issues to light. Uh, and make people aware of it because ultimately it is their government mm -hmm. and, and it's for them to decide what, what they want and the leaders that they want. Um, we're not here to play that game. There's nothing that I need personally, Chris, that I need politically. There's nothing I need personally that I need politically that I don't already have or can acquire outside of the scope. So I, I don't need a favor. Yeah. I don't need a job. You already I, have I the EFIT. The election, you, know? you already have the EFIT uh, name here, tag. I'm here for a reason and time to, to push these issues that are of concern to protect this community that my family, my family lives in. You, you know, know that's really the bottom line of why we're here and why we do what we do uh, and bringing this to light. I mean, I, that's not, you know what? What are we going to do? We're not. We're not going to run and hide on these issues. I mean, otherwise we have no business. We have no business sitting in the chairs that we are to represent our public interests. Uh, how about that new hospital? Though? Did you want? Are you want to? You know, I have to see. Yeah, the people of Guam are holding us accountable. They hold us accountable for what we do, and if they find that a senator is not doing what's in the best interest for the people of Guam, and it's self-serving or you know your buddy is opening a business or something like that that's it's not following guidelines then i ask the public please call your senators who you feel are not being accountable and let them know that you're watching and let them know that you don't agree or maybe if you do agree with them you know i i think out of a um, hundred emails that I get that uh, don't agree, you know, it's probably about 98% don't agree, but you only get that 2% of those who actually write to you and say thank you for all the hard work and sticking your neck out, you know, and doing what you're doing. Oh, but well. that, that doesn't mean we're not in for it for all the glory or anything like that. But the most important part when that comes in is when you play a part, the, the community plays a part. And, and calls your senators or emails your senators and tell them, we are not happy with this and you need to do something about it. That's what we need. And that's I'm hoping that the people of Guam are listening and do that. Be a part, make a difference. Senators are not the only ones that can go out and make a difference. You, the public can make a difference. In fact, you make a bigger difference than any of us senators could ever do by speaking out. Thank you for your time, Senators. 
Well, thanks for having us on. You yeah. take care. And Come back, back anytime. You guys are cool. We're cool. And you're cool. We're not. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Take, take care. Easy. Have a good That's day. Bye-bye. Right take on. care. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. Welcome back. Welcome back, Bree. Missed a link. Missed a lot. I tell you, you missed a lot of links. Yeah, it's been pretty hot. Pretty hot. Is Terry Huggins still at public health? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, man, I feel, oh, yeah. dude, I feel, he's such a good guy. He came on, what was he, he came on here. He was last, he was last on several, 